uh, I, I know that Meredith initially talked about, um, you know, ADUs, their square footage doesn't count on appraisal. So, you know, now that we're starting to do all these new constructions are much bigger uh, uh, in terms of footprints and square footage, you know, what's our best core, uh, what's our best course in terms of attacking these to make sure we ensure that we are, we capture our cost. Um, um, you know, I think Robert and I were looking because right now we're, we have a few projects in Burbank and we have ran some comps to determine whether, you know, what's our risk? Um, you know, are we going to go towards more two unit SB9 uh, designation versus a single family with a house? I mean, single family with an ADU. And some of our initial comps that we're looking at is, you know, especially in Burbank, um, that duplexes, two units in general, appraised a lot lower than they would as a single family with an ADU. So I, I guess in terms of identifying which direction to uh, sort of um, go in terms of, you know, strategy wise, like what's our best course, yeah. trying to find out how appraisals are actually being done right. or how appraiser would even look at these and, you know, um, where do we go from there, I guess? Yeah, yeah. Good. So good questions. Um, congratulations if you pulled off one of four <laughs> in the area. I mean, you got to get a medal for that, man. Um, so here's uh, uh, here's one question. So you guys are looking at SB9, not for so much the lot split, but more uh, let's build two primaries on a single lot, right? Yeah. So, I, I mean, the, the general strategy that we have is, of course, you know, the, the reason why we're not doing the lot split is because we don't want the owner occupancy requirement. Right. And we found out that, you know, without doing the lot split, you basically, you know, you get to rent the whole thing. Exactly. Um, and for us, our, our main strategy is to increase our portfolio because eventually I'm going to be building a fund. And so, um, you know, you know, for long-term buy and hold for our investors, whatnot. And so the, the idea here is to, for us to not only do the second unit, but also add two ADUs in the back. Right. Where, yeah. where if, it, if it permits. So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the bigger strategy there and, and, you know, identifying, you know, um, the biggest bottleneck we have is the refinance portion of it. Once it's stabilized and, you know, you know, how, how are these going to be appraised on a cash at refi or, you know. Yeah. yeah. So, the, so all of those, wish I could figure out how to. Shut this thing off. I guess I could just disconnect it. Um, and, and part of this question, Dennis, too, is, so we have the first question about when you're going in as an investor, like, you know, are you going to get more value as an SB9 unit than, which might be treated like a duplex versus treating it as an ADU? The second question is, once you refinance out of that, let's say you do an SB9 unit and one ADU would the government agencies like Fannie Mae accept that as a duplex with an ADU or Freddie Mac potentially accept that as a duplex with an ADU. Yeah. So let's talk about the second one first, because that's the easiest. So we're talking about uh, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae. So the two big giants right now, Fannie Mae, as I'm sure Mer Meredith already told you, um, does not uh, loan on two units with an ADU. So Fannie Mae is out of this game for now. It, it'll probably change. But right now, so Freddie Mac is in the game. Freddie Mac will loan on a duplex or a triplex with one additional unit. So it's one additional unit that maxes out for those guys. If it's a four unit, they won't allow another unit because then it kick, kicks into a five unit property, which everybody considers commercial apartment. So even if it's zoned single family unit, but it has two houses and one ADU, one of the houses being an SB9 unit, you think Freddie Mac would accept that? Or if it's all attached, that FHA would accept that? Um, FHA, I'm not sure. Okay. Freddie Mac should because it's le because the SB9, uh, SB9 zoning application allows for it. So it's illegally permissible. That's the thing about SB9, right? We go into the single family zones and we can get them reassigned via the SB9 um, process. Okay. So, so okay. that's the second question, right? Freddie Mac now, yes, 
you can, we could do the two homes plus an ADU. I don't see how you could do the, the two homes plus two ADUs through, through Freddie Mac. Okay, Other anyway. lenders, you know, and, and Meredith probably got some partners that can do it, but you, you don't get the benefit of the GSE financing. Mm -hmm. at, at least right now. Less expensive. Yeah. Right, exactly. Okay. So, so the first question is the real interesting one. And, and Alvin, um, you said it, and, and Robert probably uh, has seen it out in the field. Is the dynamic, the single family house plus the ADU, a better payoff than trying to build two homes? That's just a question of uh, feasibility. And as a rule, in, in a lot of neighborhoods, the single family home will sell at a premium and then the ADU is, is a benefit. Um, that happens a lot. It, it doesn't happen everywhere, but it happens a lot. So it, it's really simple. And, and you guys are the experts here. It's not just about what it will sell for. It's about, you know, what it's going to cost you to get it to, to, to either or. So you got to, I mean, you guys are making that comparison all the time. Yeah. And, and the bottom line is once you do the comparisons and run the number, whatever is left over is how much you can spend on the land, right? That's your that's what you use to figure out, okay, we can pay X for this if we assume that. So that is really a um a what I would call a subject and almost a market specific type of question. Each property, each site is going to be a little bit different. But if you're in the land of single family homes, then it's likely that the single family homes are going to be held at a, at a premium. If you're in the land of two units and three units and multi units, then it that that is probably more of a, uh, a tenant type of situation um, where the duplexes or triplexes could be better. You're kind of interesting. What you're talking about is almost a build to rent situation. We are. I mean, that's our strategy is build to rent. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I, I think that's a very, very smart strategy, but you guys are like the first guys on the moon, kind of. So, <laughs> everybody who's first, it's always, you know, I, I probably hate hearing this. It's always a hassle. Yeah, it always takes twice as long, and this, and it's always new. Um, and, oh, what are you guys trying to do? So, the build to rent, as far as the appraisal goes, the key, I think, and, and and Meredith, we're talking about, we want to try to keep this as a conforming loan to begin with. And if then we'll can. worry, yeah, if then we'll can. worry about, you know, refinancing out into something else later. If but it's not worth keeping a conforming loan. It It's worth doing a non-QM loan, a more, an investor loan that might be more expensive if the cash flow makes all the sense in the world, which usually with rents, it does. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so. Well, I mean, the, I, I would, I would throw the caveat on how it appraises. <laughs> you know, that's, yeah, that's, true. That's, that's the biggest, so, that's the biggest bottleneck we're running into. Well, here, here, here's some good news then for you. I think if you're not trying to keep it locked into um, a conforming loan with the Freddie Mac in this case, then you can go to other lenders who would treat these as a fourplex where the rents are everything. And your biggest problem in that case is going to um, find an appraiser who understands income analysis on, on two or four unit properties. Uh, and that's why I said earlier, you know, you guys are like the first men landing on the moon, not sure exactly what's gonna be there, everything is new. Most appraisers, most residential appraisers, and, and I half my career was residential. I don't want to diss on my own profession, but it's just something that they don't specialize in. Um, they're used to doing very conforming types of property. Your typical, you know, duplex, two bedroom, one bath, each one is kind of the same, or maybe a front unit a little larger than the back unit, something like this. Is what this you guys what... Talk, what you guys are talking about probably is building to get a maximum um, and maximally feasible size, you're going to be building um, units, the f at least the first two, which may be 18, 2,400, 2,000 square feet, 1,600 square feet, something that is larger than most two-unit properties per unit, I think. 
Yeah. Uh, and then as far as the ADUs, well, that's kind of simple because when you add the ADUs, they have to fall in within the, the maximum uh, uh, square footage of that, which I think is 1,200 square feet on a detached ADU. Mm -hmm. So you have the potential, uh, I'll just throw numbers out here. Let's say that each primary is the sweet spot is 1,800 square feet and the, and the ADUs are uh, 1,000 square feet. You got a 4,600 square foot fourplex which, whose value is 100% going to be based on its income uh, capacity. I mean, that's how it should be appraised. We certainly will use the sales comparison approach, just like we do with an apartments. Uh, that's how it should be appraised, and that's what's going to determine the value. Those appraisals are not Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac appraisals. Those are for a for a non... Um, um, QM. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Who, under, who understands that? So... Uh, either and when back to the appraiser, a res, certainly a residential appraiser that is familiar with the income concepts can do it. Uh, and probably, um, if it were me, if I didn't know somebody specifically, I would hire a commercial appraiser and say, "Hey, this is the the, the only difference between this and a, and a fiveplex is one unit." Yeah, you know. And and let them value it based on the income. So yeah. let me ask then, uh, if if that was the case, how how like how likely then a, a bank will reach out? You know, if they see a two to four units, how likely they then they will reach out to a, a commercial appraiser to to come out to appraise a property versus uh, you know two to four. Well, right? that's a great question, Robert, because my bank won't deal with anything above four units, right? The yeah. max we can do is the Freddie Mac um, or non-QM, three units and one ADU. So um, so the question then becomes, you know, are, yeah, as well, in your ADU training, a Dennis, do you teach them how to do the income? Yeah, but it's... For what for what you guys are talking about, Alvin and Robert and Meredith, mm -hmm. uh, you, you're talking about a rent to own four unit investment complex project. Each one is going to be a project, and that's the end result. Yeah, it's just not. It's that's something that you can't teach in a, in a day seminar. You, you know the concepts there. Uh, when I became a commercial appraiser, I had to take an extra 150 hours of class, spend another 1,500 hours working under somebody to make sure that I understood, you know, what I was doing. Um, so it's a little more complicated than uh, here's 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 a simple way to do it. So it sounds to me, though, that that means that we should be proactive in providing comparable house um, rents in the area then. Absolutely. So, I mean, the best thing, and I do recommend this, um, I'll be in San Diego or talking at the San Diego conference. ADO. Yes. One of my uh, recommendations there is always for who's ever on the development or sell side, as much information as you can put together to hand off to the appraiser. Do you got comparable rents? Are there comparable properties that, that sell? Um, you know, have that in a package, get it ready and hand it off to the appraiser. Uh, you know, some appraisers, there, there, there is no rule that says appraisers can't talk to people. Some appraisers um, are misinformed or very conservative because they don't want to be, you know, they're, they're worried about being pressured, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so there's no rule. There's no rule that says that we can't give an appraiser some information. And they should look at it. Uh, obviously, the best thing to do is the more similar the information you give them, the more appropriate it is for the appraiser to use it. So if I have a 1,800 square foot or 2,000 square foot house um, that I'm renting, I would like to give them comps that are 18 to say 24, 2,500 square feet. They're kind of competitive, that type of thing. Ideally in the same neighborhood, you know, um, so, so the answer is yes. Cost too. I give them, I, I, when first one of the first questions I ask, how much did it cost you? All in cost. All in cost, um, because 
we should consider the entire cost, hard, soft, uh, and plus, you know, whatever you, you, I don't know what your target is after the project's done on top of everything else, another 10 or 15%, a little rough times here. Maybe, maybe the incentive should be a little higher because the interest rates, it's kind of a screwy market. Whatever that case is, the all-in costs, all of those things should be given, if you can, to the appraiser. It should help them. A knowledgeable appraiser who knows what they're doing will know what to do with that information. Got so it. just just to recap, it means being proactive with the appraiser, actually having a conversation, maybe having you investors out there with the appraisers. The the loan officer should be uploading that to the you know the appraisal portal, saying a combination of things. One is comparable sales to the extent we can find it, and being proactive on that. Two is comparable rentals, and not. Uh, either from duplex or from ADUs. And I'm going to get to that um, at some point here. And um, and then three, I think it's important with design too, because if it looks like a duck, then they're going to treat it like a duck. And I'm going to give you an example of this, which is um, here. So I tend to see that ADUs rent for much, much more these are two bedroom houses. I've filtered out apartments, but if it looks like this, it's only going for 3,700. If it looks like this, it's almost double, right? So design has an element to it. In By comparison, when you look at apartments, you see that rents come down pretty considerably. Look at that. What a drop in price. So um, so it strikes me that we're seeing, and this is my next question, that ADUs are, um, just because they're popular right now, are appraising higher or have higher rents than necessarily do duplexes. And Alvin, that's what you were saying about these properties. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's there's a few things that we're dealing with right now. In fact, we're, we have a couple of projects that are four units that we're adding either one additional ADUs to or even two additional ADUs to. Uh, we have a project in Silver Lake that's currently a four unit. Uh, each of the current units are, are two bedroom, one bathroom. We, we're getting a rent because we just rehabbed them. We're getting a rent at 3000 per for the two bedrooms. And so we're building two more ADUs with two bedrooms in there. So potentially we're gonna get another 6,000 out of those. So, I mean, it's, it's you know, it, it's pretty high in terms of our rent. Um, so I, I don't know how much of that is considered. Well, I mean, in, in that particular case, you're, you're effectively going from four units to six units. Six, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so when you get that appraised, it's gonna be, it's gonna be done as a commercial loan. And and they are going to be looking at it as a as a six unit apartment. So it's how much income does this thing generate? Got it. Okay. So on that on that. Okay. So and then we have another project right now. We're actually working on where uh, in Burbank. This is another one in Burbank. Um, it's it's we're we're adding a ADU to it. Um, and right now it's an ADU, uh, and we don't know if we should. We just found out you can redesignate after it's built as a SB9. Uh, so if you if we could do that, does is it worth doing it just so we can capture the square footage of it? And again, you know, in terms of appraisal, like is it going to be? Are we getting the the price per square foot that we're looking for? Yeah. So 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 uh, a good question. So just by. What's the, how big is the, in that particular case, how big is the primary unit? Uh, well, the primary, okay, so good question. Um, the primary unit will be... 1,600, almost 1,600. Yeah, 1,600, yeah. Okay, and so the secondary or the ADU, whatever whatever it ends up being, is, is going to be about 1,200? Uh, no, 700. 700 yeah, square foot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, taking a guess, I think you probably get more value as a primary, if... if there, if that's a predominantly single-family neighborhood, yes, I think you get a bigger bang for the sixteen hundred and and the ADU because that difference is uh, uh, pretty significant in, in size difference. You could see somebody owner occupant 
applying to live in the primary and then renting out the secondary. Okay. You know, no. that's, that's what, that's the way that the market works a lot of time. Is it big enough for me to move in there and my extended family or I'm going to get some rental income on the ADU, one or the other. Okay. So, no. so, so are they still, cons they're not, they're not going to mean appraisal wise is the score for is not going to be considered then as a, uh, for the ADU. Yeah. Uh, I mean, so even if, if we were to convert it as an SB nine instead. Yeah. So <laughs> the score footage, the way to, the way to value these things is really not square footage. I mean, homes get valued based on square footage. Uh, ADUs get valued based on um, their their whole packages and amenity. Is a is a twelve hundred square foot ADU worth more than a nine hundred square foot ADU? Sure. Is a twelve hundred square foot ADU worth more than a a, a thousand or eleven hundred square foot ADU? Probably not. Not in the market. The market isn't that precise. Cost cost you more. But the the market isn't that precise. It kind of it it kind of grays out at a certain point. Where houses people are looking at the houses as I'm going to live in this one space, and I need X amount of space. And then what is what is what is in that space for me to to utilize? Yeah. So so the question then becomes like: Is a 1,200 square foot ADU versus a 1,200 square foot SB9, which is like a, a second house? Which one will give more value? Yeah, um, that's that is the tough question because now you got two houses on one lot, right? So it's it's two what houses on one lot, and you're not subdividing. You're not subdividing the lot. It's all on one lot. Can you Correct. just out of curiosity? Can you make these turn these into condos once you build them in LA? Uh, I guess you could. I, I just don't know how to. How would you do that? I guess you have to have an HOA and co-op loans. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's something to think about. I mean, because that that would be a great exit strategy after the build to rent, hold it for eight or ten years, and then sell them as condos. Anyway. Can I ask what the property address is? Uh, well, six North Pass. It's what? Six one eight North Pass. Yeah, and they have another one in Eagle Rock too. That's uh. That's in Burbank. So, so I think what, based on what uh, Dennis is saying, I think I think number one, I don't think we can do a HOA because I don't. Um, I think there's a law in the in the code saying that we can't turn into like an HOA or like a TIC or something like that. Okay. Oh, yeah. So, okay. But Alan, to try to give you a, a precise answer on your question, is it worth more doing this than that? Um, that you're not going to like the answer. That subjects and site specific. Um, if it's two houses on one lot, it's a duplex. You know, if it's a if it's a primary house and an ADU, it's a single family plus an ADU. Uh, if you have two large duplexes, um, you should be at the top of the market as far as rent goes, and, and it may be worth more than anything else that's in there because you might not have anything comparably sized, right? Uh, it, are there 3,200 square foot uh, duplexes or 2,800 square foot duplexes there? If there are, then, it, the, you know, the appraisers are going to look at that size wise, uh, but they should be looking at income. The problem with using a, what I would call the, uh, a traditional a residential appraiser on these properties is that they are have been hammered and trained that all values need to be supported by the sales comparison approach. So if I cannot, even if it's an income property, if I cannot find sales that bracket the subject, I have to have one that's kind of close. I have to have one that's a little higher. I have to have one that's a little lower and poof, my value should be somewhere in the middle if we can't find that, there is a real hesitancy, both on appraiser side and on a lot of lenders side. That's why um, Marilyn and I have been working on trying to get the word out. This is this is a a product which is it's the change is happening, but it's very very slow. You guys are on the leading edge, and um, 
you know, if you go the in if you if you go to the two unit um, configuration, and you're convinced that the income can support, it's feasible. We can build this thing because look at the income; it makes sense. Then all then all you have to do is find a lender and an appraiser who understands how to do income and a lender that's com comfortable in lending on the income and, and poof, you got a done deal. <coughs> Certainly as, as an investor, if I had all cash, I'd be doing that all day. The problem is trying to get the loan. We've got to convince the appraiser and the lender that, hey, you know what? Uh, I, this actually works, guys. <laughs> well, that's what we're working on. Yeah, yeah. So, I, you know, I. It's not the precise answer. Hey, just do this. Or on this side of the block, you can do this. And on that side of the block, you can do that. It, 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 boy, if it was that, I'd be the richest guy around. <laughs> and so, honestly, so you guys really are on the cutting edge. I mean, the UC Berkeley Turner Center came out. There have only been nine SB9 cases in the entire state. Four were in Los Angeles, and, and that was one of them was yours. That's how bleeding edge you are. We have to. <laughs> oh, too. <laughs> and, and the reason that is is because it's 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 the law of unintended consequences. The legislature said, "Hey, we got a great idea here. We got all this land. Why don't we just enable it to be rezoned, and we can we can almost double our density." Yeah. But they designed it so it makes developers extremely difficult to be part of that. And mom and pop do not have the wherewithal financially or competency wise to be developers. So that's where they really messed up. They, there's no good bridge to allow developers to come in. So it's really financially feasible. We got to look, we're not trying to rip anybody off, but we're not going to do this for free. <laughs> you, you, you know? Yeah. So yeah, you guys being at the front of the tip of the spear, my hats off to you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I guess so, the, the bottleneck becomes too like you know appraisal is one thing, uh, yeah. and also you know lenders. <laughs> There's not not too many of them, or maybe not any of them. Um, in well, fact, on your last project in Burbank, I mean we had an incredible increase in value, right? Right. You bought at one point three, you put in two hundred thousand. It initially appraised with an average or untrained appraiser at 1.4, and we came, our appraiser came in at 1.9, one of Dennis's trained guys. But the rents didn't, didn't was was the issue with making the leap to that, the rental income. Was it the rental in income? I can't remember. Yep. It was the rental income that was a little bit short enough to justify covering the debt service on it. That was the challenge. Well, I gotta tell you, those are Airbnbs. <laughs> so, I'm sure they're killing it. <laughs> so they're 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 killing it like by a lot. <laughs> I right. think we're cash flowing. I think on an average, I, what is that, three to four thousand a month on those, or on that one pro property. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So um, yeah. So you gotta find more lenders, I guess, and better appraisals. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, what you got? I mean, as far as the appraisal goes, you got to find an appraiser who is who understands income, and then work with a lender who who understands income. I mean, look, I think Meredith gave the the perfect example of that leap. How can you go from this to that after only spending two hundred thousand dollars? Well, the way to do it is that two hundred thousand dollars generate a hell of a lot more income. I'll give you another example. Um, so I do reviews for commercial banks mm -hmm. and they got clients, investors. One of them bought a uh, fourplex in Berkeley and used the ADU laws to increase the unit size, but on, and this was student housing. So UC Berkeley, uh, mm -hmm. uh, for that, they're priced on a per bed basis. So I think they spent, they converted the existing basement and they built a detached ADU and they spent, spent close to uh, eight or nine hundred thousand dollars on all their costs, all in renovation. But they increased the value by more than two and a half times because of the rent. I mean, it, it was, we don't see arbitrage like that. I mean, not exactly risk-free, so not the perfect arbitrage, but 
pretty damn close, right? Wow. Uh, and, and that's what this situation um, presents itself. And the problem is, is that but both appraisers and, 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 and lenders, they're just not comfortable with that concept. You know, if there's one thing that I would like to write in an appraisal report, it's believe it or not, because they don't believe it. So the income is the generator. If you find the appraisers who understand the income, like the last example, you find a lender that understands how, how that works, like the last example. NOI is critical for debt service. That's something that most appraisers, residential appraisers, period, don't understand. I didn't know that until I started doing commercial, how important the NOI was. A lot of times more important than the value. So, uh, you, you know, that's why I, and, until we get the residential fold up to speed, which will happen eventually, if it's me, I'm trying to find a commercial person <coughs> maybe understand it fully and not be afraid to go down the income path to value. That's Dennis, I think we have our next mission in getting these ADU appraisers um, trained up a little bit more. <laughs> yeah, and and uh, you mentioned finding an appraisal, but sometimes we have no control over that. So on our yeah, end. Yeah, yeah, you know what? I, you, you don't have any direct control, but you certainly have influence upon those who do. I, I mean, you can make a request. Here's the best example I can think of. What was it, five, six years ago when they required new construction to start including um, photovoltaic systems? Mm -hmm. And appraisers didn't know how to value those systems. And more and more people were going green and getting those systems. When the borrowers, when the developers started demanding, hey, I'm tired of you guys sending out an appraiser who just looks at this and doesn't consider it at all. You need to send somebody out here who's been trained in at least what, they don't even know what the damn system is. Things change. And now those systems are getting valued as they should have all along. So it does take time. Um, it will happen. And there's some that are out there. I don't want them to say, hey, no, none of these guys can do it. No, there are some, they're just hard to find. You can't you can't choose directly. You don't you can't manage, but you can you can press. Look, this is a complicated situation. It's it's a new development. This is something that commercial guys do all the time. The, the values and the income. Mm -hmm. Whoever you send out, make sure that they're experienced and competent. That is the lender's responsibility to match the appraiser's competence and experience with the assignment. So you can press that all all day long. Okay. Awesome. Great. Dennis, thank you so much for your time. Um, I mean, this, this has been very, very helpful. Just even kind of brainstorm a little bit here now that we have a better understanding of how to approach this, or maybe not. I don't know yet. We're still, I feel like we're still <laughs> gambling either way, but but I, yeah. I think, um, you know, hopefully some lenders are listening, <laughs> you know, if this ever goes public. Uh, well, that, that, there's a definite need for that, and and I'm even constant. I'm even contemplating on starting an actual debt fund, or or you know, to service just this particular problem specifically. So this is very very helpful. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, the rent, the the build to rent concept is is taking off. Um, there's just no doubt about it, and it is an answer. Um, especially with SB9, because you now we have land that we can develop for rental units where we didn't have before. Yeah, that's right. So, so there's an answer here. You guys have a, a solution to a problem. And it seems to me that it's not only financially feasible, but you should be able to get um, on board what's always helpful, the local